Hi everybody, and welcome to our webinar on education options. So today we're going to look at brain development, the learning stages that children go through, and education options for working parents. I hope this is helpful to you. So my name is Judy Arnell and I am a certified family life educator. I am a specialist in brain and child development and I'm also an education consultant. And I'm also an author. I've written several books on non-punitive parenting and education. Um, the first book I wrote was Discipline Without Distress and it's all about handling misbehavior from ages zero to 20 without punishment. And then I wrote Parenting with Patience because everybody said, oh, please, we need to calm down before we get to that non-punitive parenting. So this is a book all about handling stress, anger, handling your stress and your children's anger. And then the latest book is Attachment Parenting Tips. There's no theory in that book. It's just tips on every kind of parenting challenge from babies to teenagers and how to handle it. And of course, we did a DVD called Plugged In Parenting on handling screen time and all that good stuff. And it's been translated into various languages. My latest book is um, Unschooling to University and it's a book on education options outside of the traditional school system. And we'll talk more about that as we go through those options. I also have a blog called Unschooling STEM. Actually, it's not a blog, it's a Facebook group. So welcome to join us. <laughs> and I have a blog detailing our travels on world schooling and, and everything we did, homeschooling and online schooling. And this is where you can find it. And I also have a blog on parenting. So you can find me there too. Okay, so I just to talk a little housekeeping things. Um, I turned my video on for the first bit just so that you can see me and um, kind of get to know me and then I find it distracting. So I'm going to turn it off for the majority of the presentation as I go through slides. Hope that's okay. I'm just going to advance the screen here. So I just want to be clear. We love teachers and we love learning. And unfortunately, right now, the whole education system is being disrupted due to COVID-19 and our, our, how our fall looks, nobody knows. So we're not too sure if the kids are going back to school and what that looks like. And parents are looking for options. So today I hope to run through some options for you and what's the best option for each age group? This webinar is copyrighted professional parenting 2020. Um, feel free to view it, but please do not distribute it. So when we ask people, what are the ways you've learned what you know today? We've asked this of adults, and these are all the things they come up with of where they have learned. And as you can see, traditional school is only one of many ways to learn what um, children need to know. Now, <laughs> up until now, 1.5 billion people in the world have what we call homeschooled their children as of March. However, that is not homeschooling. What they have been practicing is what we call distance education from the school, whereas true homeschooling is what we tend to call home education and it's controlled by the parent. Right now what typical families are doing is distance education in their living room, but it's controlled by the school. And if you look at the news, you will see all these confidence underminers headlines that say how difficult homeschooling has been. What a nightmare it's been. It's been a struggle and stressful and, and it's just so hard to do. And what these headlines are really explaining is why it's very hard for parents to implement distance education 
that's controlled by someone else, which is the school, and try and impose that on their children who may or may not accept it. So we want to be very clear in terms of education options now, it's not so much of where the education takes place, whether it's in a classroom or in your living room. It's a matter of who controls it, who makes the decisions on what the kids learn, who delivers the content, and who assesses whether the learning is being absorbed or not. And that boils down to only two options, school, government school, or the parent. Okay, so it's either distance education under school, or it's home education under a parent. And within those two categories, there's a range of options that you probably never even heard of. And that's my goal today is just to let you know what those options are so you can make the best decisions for your children. So remember, it's not where learning takes place, it's who controls it. So let's first look at government school. Now, government school has different jurisdictions, whether it's province, state, or country. And it is controlled. All the decisions are made by the government. And it comes in different forms. What we call blended can be a hybrid of those different delivery models. Your child could go learn in a classroom or could learn through correspondence programs or online courses or even outdoor programs, which is sometimes called forest school. But the main point of these is it is taught by a certified teacher. It is not taught by parent, which we classify as homeschooling. So when it's taught by a teacher, it's distance education. And the other legal jurisdiction is what we call home education, and it's controlled by the parent or the legal guardian of the child. Now, under that are lots of options. Many parents are looking into homeschooling this fall or government school. They think that's the only two options, but they may not want to teach. Many parents do not want to homeschool. I was one of them. <laughs> I like to say we were homeschoolers that never got around to homeschooling. But you don't have to be the teacher when you do a legal home education program. So you can be the teacher if you want, or you could outsource it to maybe your child care professional can facilitate your child's learning or you can get together with other parents or adults and form co-ops based on what your children's interests are. So you could take turns, what we call team teaching. You could do a self-directed unschooling approach with your child where you empower them to take the lead on their learning based on their interests and through their play. Or you can outsource it further to online micro schools um, where children can sign up with a, a virtual charter school, not necessarily through your government, but they are popping up all over the world, needless to say, to meet a need. And that need is for parents who don't want to homeschool but want their children to go to a school. That tends to be all or nothing. You sign up for the whole school or not the school. And then there's the other option of a la carte courses. So these are courses that are about an hour long. They're one teacher from somewhere around the world with eight to 10 students in their online environment. And it's interest-based. It's based on one topic. And I describe this as pods, learning pods in my Unschooling to University book. But these courses are cost 10 to 15 dollars 
and they're not all day. You don't sign up for the whole package. You sign up for one course based on your child's interest and concentration level, of course. But all of these options can only be undertaken under the parent control. So under a legal home education program. Governments decide what they're going to teach, how, when, where, who, and if. But under home education, parents become the general contractor and procure their child's education based on all of these options. So students are now borderless. They can learn from any course or resource anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be the local government school. And the future is proving qualifications by either taking exams or demonstrating a portfolio of work done. Boundaries and government regulation are becoming less important. Education is being disrupted. So let's look at these options a bit more in depth. So the government schools, like I said, they can be a classroom, but this fall, most government schools are looking at a hybrid model, what we call blended education of some classroom, some online or some print based. That's probably what it's gonna look like and what those proportions are, it depends. Um, and Forest schools could be outside just because outdoors is a lot safer than indoors, but we don't know what that is going to look like or what schools are going to offer in that environment. And then homeschooling, the adult or teacher can outsource um, the teaching to anybody, <laughs> maybe a co-op, maybe a childcare professional, or maybe um, this is a Minecraft co-op, <laughs> or maybe the child themselves through what we call unschooling or self-directed learning. So all children are actually born self-directed. Um, from babies, they learn through play. And traditionally at age six, we say, okay, you can't play anymore. You have to go to this place called school. And you're going to learn what the government wants you to learn. But a lot of proponents of self-directed education say, nope, we're going to let the child keep on playing till they um, indicate a more desire for formal education. And that usually happens around the late teen years where they decide what they want to do for their career and they jump through a few hoops to go get the qualifications they need because they're ready. But those children learn everything they need to learn through play rather than school. And the two main categories of learning that every child needs is numeracy and literacy. So reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> and every child can learn that through just their day-to-day -day play. They do. Um, most children learn to read anywhere between the ages of four and seven, and sometimes later, sometimes 10. And because it happens during the school years, we assume that they learn it through school, but it's a developmental stage. They're going to learn whether they go to school or not. So unschooling is defined as freedom to learn anything they want to learn. Um, it can be through curriculum, but a lot of unschoolers do not use curriculum. It's a philosophy and lifestyle of educational freedom in which a child's natural curiosity and motivation nurtured in a stimulating environment will lead the child to learn what he or she needs to know in the time frame he or she needs it. And it's kind of like a buffet of knowledge. The learner stands there with an empty plate and decides what to pick to put on their plate to learn. They become very self self-governed. Um, children who are used to entertaining themselves and taking on their education do not need to be kept busy. They do not need to be entertained. And this is true for a lot of homeschooled children too who have so much time they fill themselves. Um, you see a remarkable difference between children who have not been spoon-fed their education all the way along 
They really become independent entertainers and learners. So for unschooling, the components required is an adult facilitator, could be childcare, um, resources can be just as basic as a library card and the internet, and lots of free time. And you can offer all these things, but quite a lot of these things will not be available this fall, like museums probably. We'll see, and they might, but they might not. What do children do all day when homeschoolers have so much time and unschoolers have so much time? These are things they do, and they build academic skills, social skills, um, physical skills, emotional skills, and lots of skills. There's lots of benefits to self-directed education or unschooling. And the biggest benefit is there is no motivation problems whatsoever. You do not have to battle your child to do a few worksheets for homeschooling. You don't have to fight with them to stay attentive to this online course they're supposed to be taking. There is no motivation problems because they are self-directed. They learn what they want to learn. So it's very much absorbed and it's deep. And the next biggest one is a child is always developmentally ready for the material. Always, because they're learning at their own pace. I'm not going to go through all these just for time, but <laughs> you could stop it now and just read them yourselves. Okay, and then online micro schools and the a la carte courses are, there are so many of those popping up right now. Um, if you go to my blog, unschoolingtouniversity.com, and you look at the tab called Giant List of Online Resources, there is a 15 page list of everything your child could take for courses online. And that doesn't even begin to let you know what's out there. <laughs> there are so many courses. And whether the parent picks them out or the learner picks them out, a lot of teenagers will just go online and find the best coding program for them. And they self learn, they self teach, and we have to recognize that kids are natural learners. We just need to get out of their way. And all these schools and course companies are popping up to meet that need for parents to get their kids engaged online and in different subject areas. Okay, I'm gonna just tell you briefly a little bit about our story and just assure you, you will not mess up your kids no matter what you decide this fall, not at all. So I had five kids and their learning needs were not met within our government system. Um, they all, or the two oldest started out with school and I soon became doing what a lot of parents doing, what we call after schooling. So the kids would go to school all day and then come home and learn what they really, really want to learn. Such as, if you plant an egg, will it grow an egg tree? And um, the more we did that, the more I realized that I may as well just bite it and let's start homeschooling. So we did that. And by a couple months, we, we started off with distance education and I found the kids weren't listening to me. They didn't want to do the work. Um, we, we just let things slide. So the more and more we were homeschooling, but became unschoolers. So my role shifted from teacher to facilitator of their learning. And we had a lot more fun. As you can see this workbook my son wrote on it, I hate mathematics. When he was forced to do book work mathematics at age seven, he hated it. But we dropped it. We let them learn mathematics through play. And he eventually became an engineer. And I knew all this because I teach adults. And adults are self-directed learners, but we don't give the same privilege to children. So my kids wrote our grade 12 government exams and they did very well compared to the provincial average. They got scholarships and four kids went to universities. Three went into STEM programs and we have three graduates so far and one child is off to a master's program this fall. 
And at the same time, friends of my kids were going off to post-secondary. And these were kids who unschooled too. And I looked around and thought, if I know 30 unschoolers within our um, circle of friends, there's got to be more out there. So I wrote a book based on their profiles called Unschooling to University. And we look at all different areas of unschooling, all the, um, what about math? How will they get into university? Um, what about, you know, where, where will they learn to read? And all the 30 kids were unschooled three to 12 years. They were all accepted to college, tech, and universities. And we had 10 STEM students, 10 humanities, and 10 art students. We actually had four engineers in the group. So they learned without school and without homeschooling. They learned based on pursuing their passions and interests. Okay, so the last part here, I wanna go through a little bit about brain development, learning stages, and help you to choose what is the best education option for your children. So, Human development research should inform educational practice. I truly believe this. Dr. Thomas Armstrong quoted this. <clears throat> and let's start with the brain because the brain is where <laughs> all education starts and ends. So babies are born with 100 billion of these neurons, which we call brain cells. And for the most part, they're not connected until after birth, when they start transmitting neurotransmitters from one brain cell to another through the axons and dendrites meeting. So you'll see this here, a neurotransmitter will come down this um, um, axon and meet to this axon on this dendrite of this neuron. Let's see this. Hmm. Okay, my video is not going to work. <laughs> Anyways, that's what happens. Um, so you can see these neurons at birth, and for the most part, not many of them are connected. Just the, the brain stem neurons, um, what we call the, the bottom brains parts, the cerebellum, the occipital lobe are connected. And by age seven, after birth, through experiences, there are tons of connections and then the brain has to prune those connections by age 15 to become more sharper and stronger and basically if children learn something by age seven and they don't continue it they will lose it because you you use what you lose you lose what you don't use and it's important to know that play grows brain connections just as much as academic workbooks do. Children of all ages need more play. And whether it's play or doing an online class here at age seven, it will connect those brain connections just the same. So children develop physically, cognitively, socially, and emotionally. And the brain develops from the bottom to the top and from the back of the brain to the front. The bottom brain functions are what develops first and the frontal brain connections are what develops last. Like I said, in babies, the brain stem, the cerebellum and the occipital lobe are very much um, developed to keep the heart and lungs and motor controls going. And then the toddler stage, more the temporal, emotional areas of the brain are sensitive. And then the parietal lobe is very sensitive in preschool years and the frontal lobe in the school age years and the prefrontal cortex in the teen years. This is my diagram, which I kind of like better <laughs> than the other one. Um, just to let you know, if you want to remember an easy way to remember these parts and how they are more sensitive during different groups, I think, okay, brainstem, baby, temporal, toddler, parietal, preschooler, frontal, first grader, prefrontal, 
puberty. Okay, so that is how the brain develops. So you can't expect a toddler to have self-control while they're having a temper tantrum because this prefrontal cortex, this reasoning, decision-making part of the brain is the last to develop. Okay, so let's look at this. Babies, um, again, bottom brain functions are very sensitive, but at this point, they're just, the brain is just experiencing sensory input and output. They're building attachment and trust with their caregivers, and they do not have a whole lot of higher order thinking skills here. Young toddlers, their job is to build security and explore their environment, and they do not have that prefrontal cortex um, sense of safety or decision making or risk. So we have to protect them while they're exploring. Now, at this stage, the toddler stage, they learn to walk. And we don't teach it. <laughs> Every child learns to walk. It's a developmental skill like talking and reading. Older toddlers are between 18 months and three years. And the midbrain, the temporal region here is the most sensitive. So they're starting to get a flood of emotions and they can't handle them. That's why you get so many temper tantrums in the toddler years. Um, what's sensitive is the hippocampus, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, all those great parts of the limbic system that help them with their language recognition, learning words, learning to talk, their visual memory, and their emotional responses. So they're building security and confidence. And they also learn to talk at about ages two and up. And that's another skill we don't teach. We model it by talking to them, but we don't actively teach them how to talk. There's no workbook on it. Now, preschoolers are age three to five. And this is where the back brain is starting to become very sensitive. They're thinking, they're questioning, they're processing their sensory input, and they learn through their five senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, um, and the other one. <laughs> so their sensory processing, their attention is getting a bit better, their language is starting to get really better, and they're looking at objects in relation to others. So they're learning about their world. The interesting part about this is there's a 40 here. What that means is if you ask a, a child under age five to do something, about 40% of the time, they'll listen to you or do what you ask. 60% of the time, they're not going to listen to you. And that's a developmental issue. That is not a discipline issue. And that's why I love to teach child development when I'm talking about discipline and parenting because parents need appropriate expectations. If your five-year-old is sitting in front of a screen and is losing interest, that is not a discipline issue. That's a development issue. They don't have the self-regulation to sit there and concentrate and we do not expect that. So here's another graph that kind of shows you that development. Um, I ask parents, can a three-year-old play chess? And most of them will say, no. <laughs> can a seven-year-old play chess? Most of them will say yes. And that is knowledge of child development and the development of executive function. Now, executive function sits in the prefrontal cortex, a lot of it. Um, there's four components, working memory, focus, self-control, and planning and risk-taking. And as you can see here by the development, from zero to three, very little self-control. That's why toddlers tantrum. Um, from three to age five is the biggest leap here of self-control. But as you can see, it's developing. 
So you can't automatically think a four-year-old is going to have the self-control that a six-year-old would. And this is why most children do not start mandatory school until age six or seven, because they do not have that ability to sit still, pay attention, don't bug your little neighbor, and don't poke him with your pencil. <laughs> that comes here during the school age years. And then the next leap is from 13 to 25, and mostly around 17. So all those children who have self-directed their learning and unschooled start to get a little more serious about planning for their career and having that self-control to sit down and maybe take a math course that's more formal or doing a textbook in biology that's more paper-based learning. So that's the development of executive function. So babies, toddlers, and preschoolers all learn through their five senses, hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, putting things in their mouths. And they learn it through play. So the best education option for this age, self-directed play, or what we call unschooling. And play should be always determined by the child. It's free play, it's not directed play. Here are some really good play materials. So if you're a parent working at home, I would suggest um, having lots of these play materials on hand, but don't put them all out at once. Rotate them. And so children forget after about a couple weeks, they forget about what toys they have. So when you bring them out again and they've been packed away for a while, they're new toys to them. These are unstructured play materials. They're, they have the best play value because they can be combined and they build, in so many ways, they build imagination and creativity and they last for hours and hours of play value. They keep kids busy. Structured play materials, on the other hand, have an age range. So if your child is six months too early or six months too late, they will either find it too frustrating and hard to do, or they will find it too easy and boring. So they do have their place, but you will get much more time and um, play value out of the unstructured materials. And here they are again. There's no one right way to play. This is something on the go. If you're out and about, you, have, you don't wanna put your kids on screens, this is some things you can throw in there that will keep them very, very busy and creative. More ways to keep them busy. I know I've had five children. <laughs> I've homeschooled and I had a partner who worked out of the country. So I also worked part time and wrote books. So I mastered ways to keep my kids busy. Babysitting co-ops are wonderful. Um, there might be teens around this year, so hire a teen that um, you trust will, you know, be very responsible regarding physical distancing. And like I said, rotate toys. 90% of the toys, if children have them out, they just don't see anything. So pack most of them away and then bring them out. Pack those away, bring them out, new ones. And feel free to ease up on screen time rules. As long as children are hearing lots of language, so you're talking to them, you're reading to them, you're singing to them, they're going to be ahead. And if they have lots of conversation times, they will do fine, even though you may overdo the screen time bit. There are lots more play ideas at my parenting blog, judyarnow.com. Feel free to put in the search bar play and you will come up with all kinds of things we did to keep our kids play and keep the mess down. Okay, the next stage is the school agers. So this is age six to 12. This is where the frontal brain is really coming to, to, um, to sensitivity and they're starting to build skills and relationships. It's a lot easier to work when you have six to 12 year olds around. And especially, like I said, the secret in homeschooling is don't entertain your children. They will find things to do. All you have to do is make sure they clean up the mess. 
before they take out the next thing to do. <laughs> they still do need supervision. Um, children before age 10 need supervision in the kitchen, making things through the microwave. And before age 12, they definitely need help with the stove and the oven and appliances. So, um, but up until then, they, they, you know, they can really take off and become more independent in their play and learning. But they also learn best through their five senses. Hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, not so much putting things in their mouth anymore, but talking to each other. And they play very well together. About the age three on up, children start playing very well through play dates too. This is the age that most children learn to read. Again, it's another skill like talking and walking that we don't teach. They get it. They crack the code and every child has their own developmental schedule. These are the ages my kids read, four, five, eight, nine, and 10. And the 10 year old, you couldn't tell he read a year later because he was reading books this big. So <laughs> we live in a literate society. Kids will see words everywhere. You can't stop them from learning to read. They will learn to read, especially if you have a language rich home. If you read to them, you have books they can read and you have conversations, enhance their vocabulary by using lots of different words, your child will learn to read. This is also a time they learn to write. And I believe writing comes from passion. They need to have something to say. So we have never forced writing in our house. When the kids need to write, they want to do it. and They want to learn how. Needless to say, their handwriting wasn't the best, but when they got to university, they decided they needed to practice and their handwriting got a lot better within three months. So the best education options for this age um, is parent homeschooling, childcare homeschooling, co-op homeschooling, self-directed learning or unschooling, or a la carte online courses or government schools of outdoor programs. So children of this age are still very limited in how long they will spend in front of a screen learning a government school agenda. So in um, our jurisdiction, our education ministry states that children under age 10 should not be on online classes. And that follows their developmental stage and their development of their prefrontal cortex until they have the focus, the concentration, and the ability to sit and look at something online for an hour, I wouldn't sign up for full-time online school. I would do a more a la carte version where it, you, you just pay for one class and then if they don't wanna do it, it's only $15. So teenagers are much more suited for online courses. And then again, you have to take into consideration their learning style. So teenagers are 13 to age 19, and their prefrontal brain is enabling them to do critical analysis within context of healthy mentoring adult relationships. So they can think abstractly, theoretically, and again, that temporal region of feelings is heightened. So here, they listen to you. When you ask them to do something, they listen about 80% of the time because they have that self-control. Now, adults and teenagers also learn best through five senses. We know that through learning theory, but that's not always possible. So as much as possible, see if you can teach through their hearing, their seeing, their touching, their smelling, their talking, but they're also ready for more paper-based work or theoretical work. So there, they're ready for textbooks, workbooks, maybe more online courses. But only if they're an online learner. Some children are very kinesthetic learners and prefer to learn through their senses. 
So they're really keen to learn things like ideologies. Um, they're, they're very, very interested. They do a lot of research on the internet through their own um, initiative. Math at this stage is learning about solving problems. And the more real world problems they can solve, the better. I prefer to present them with a problem and then teach them the paper-based way to work it out. So for example, here, we ordered a half cheesecake for a birthday party and took it out of the box and discovered that that didn't really look like a half a cheesecake, but how do we prove it? So it became a really good lesson on teaching kids how to work out pi on paper. So we used pi to measure the cake. And grade eight or age 13, 14 is a good time to go from mental math to paper math. Um, I found a lot of these math concepts my children learn through play, not through math textbooks or workbooks or courses, through play and through applying to real life problems. Here's some more things they learned. So at age 13, they were more ready to attack these abstract theories. And they could understand it a lot better because they had the experiential learning to base it on. This is a really cool um, display in a museum. This is filled with water. And as you turn this, you can see that the big square fills the two little squares. And that's the Pythagoras theorem. So remember, age 13 to 15, that development of the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, is um, the final touches of brain development. And it's when teenagers really can think abstractly and critically. And they're more motivated to produce, pursue paper-based work at that age or online courses. And again, you can see it in this graph here, right? So here from about age 12 on more suited to online learning. This area is still experiential learning. Best education options for teenagers, government schools. So if they do a blend of print-based correspondence, classroom and online, that's when teenagers can really um, move between those three delivery methods. If you want, you can continue with parent, childcare or co-op homeschooling or many teenagers still continue with self-directed unschooling um, types of learning and a la carte online courses are great and then they might want to just sign up for a full day schedule of micro schools if if that's what they want so pretty well teenagers they can learn anyway <laughs> okay Music lessons, again, um, you don't need to stress these when kids are young. When they're ready, the teacher appears. You can absolutely, um, children's brains are never ever finished learning. It is easier to learn music when they're five, but it is certainly okay to learn music when they're 25 and they're more motivated to actually practice. Same with learning languages. I witnessed that with my kids. Um, I would put them in French at age seven. They learned a whole year of French by teenagerhood, forgot it all. Unless they're using it, they're not gonna retain it. So better to learn it when they're gonna use it. So when they went off traveling, they went off to university, internships in different countries, that's when they really learn languages. And there's always ways to do it through Duolingo or, um, I mean, my kids just watch Disney videos on YouTube in different languages. <laughs> okay, here's a common question. Oh dear, what if you give kids all this free time and they play video games all day? So I had five children who were gamers and this is a picture I told them. I just had it one day and I said, okay, go outside and play. That's it. Put the games away. Go outside and do something fun. So half an hour goes by and it's really quiet. And I go outside and there they are on the deck <laughs> playing their Nintendo Wii through the glass sliding doors. <laughs> but anyways, there's 
families who are limiters and there's families on the continuum at the other end who do not limit any screen time. And the research shows so far, and it's very little research, but the research shows that except for young children, there's not really any detrimental effects to playing video games and screen time and the quantities. Um, there's no toxic stress from adverse childhood experiences. That is a big one. That's a big factor. And you want to make sure their childhood is free from toxic stress. And there's no, um, the chances of having an addiction to game time is minimal in families free from toxic stress and ACEs. In families where there's rich language and conversations, the young ones will do just fine even though they have a lot of screen time because they're learning language in real relationships. So keep that up. And in the, in the, um, the hope of getting moderation and balance, have some tech-free times for both adults and kids. Enjoy the family time together. Spend time together. Make sure a lot of it's tech-free time. So my kids will play a lot of hours of video games all day, but I make sure we go for a family bike ride after supper and our dinner table is a tech-free time. We talk. So we're getting our exercise and we also like to have some healthy sleep hygiene practices. So um, the kids are encouraged to put away, put their cell phones in the sleep basket and to stay off games at least one to two hours before bedtimes. So if you Make sure all those things are in place and the kids go overboard on screen time. Relax. They'll be fine. They will not be addicted and they will not have adverse effects from too much screen time. And you know what? Video games and a lot of internet games, iPad games, teach cooperation, commitment, teamwork, critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, and innovation. I did a whole blog post on why video gaming is just as stimulating for brain cells as math workbooks. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up here. Does learning ever stop? Never. <laughs> you can't force a child to learn and you cannot stop a child from learning. It all depends on whose agenda. And the more you empower learners to explore what they want to learn, the more they're gonna learn um, everything they need to know academically. They absolutely will. They'll come to it on their own learning. And every child owns their education. I'm gonna end with this little poem on play because I'm a, I'm a play proponent. I tried to teach my child with words. They often passed them by unheard. I tried to teach my child with books. He only gave me puzzled looks. Despairingly, I turned aside. How can I teach this child, I cried. Into my hand, he placed the key. Come, he said, and play with me. And that's by Anonymous. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this presentation today. If you want more information, this is my book on education, Unschooling to University. It's available in worldwide <laughs> through bookstores. If you want to order it at your local bookstore, you can they can find it for you. Or if you just want the um, ebook, it's available to through bookstores or through Amazon. And if you want to keep in touch with me, you have questions, feel free to find me. I'm out there. <laughs> and I hope this was helpful in terms of what to expect in parenting with your child's brain development, what learning stages they will go through, and what would be the best education options for your child this fall. You're their parent, you're their first and best teacher, you have been teaching them since they were born. And that does not go away. Most parents can teach their children up until about grade eight, um, just through your knowledge and you have a lot of experience you have a knowledge a lot of knowledge to share and that has been the norm for the 
past thousands of years. It's only the last 125 years that parents have been internalizing this notion that they, they're inept to teach their children, and they certainly are not. So you can do it. You will not mess them up, and your children will keep on learning. So good luck, and thank you, and have a great year. You will love it. Okay, bye-bye.